Hello, everyone, and thank you for tuning in to Tickets with Tay. Uh, thank you for everyone who's tuned in, tapped in, listened, commenting and liking and subscribing. So thank you very much. It's an op uh, a great opportunity to give everyone within the ticket collecting community a voice. And today is absolutely no different. We have Ku here, who is a avid collector of different things from soccer tickets to a bit of boxing and movie tickets. So I'll let him introduce himself. Uh, yeah. So my name is Ku. I'm based in the south of Ireland in Cork City. And I've only really been into collecting tickets since roughly March of 2023. Um, so as you were saying, you know, it's mostly, I suppose, boxing. Uh, that I've been collecting, but also a little bit of football and then the odd few movie tickets and kind of oddities like that as well. Very interesting. So you say quite recently you got into tickets. What was the um, what was it that you got got you into it? What was the initiation into ticket collecting? It was pretty much a, a pure fluke. Um, I just came across a bit of money at one point, and I was like, <laughs> you know, something. I'm just gonna I'm gonna buy something for myself <laughs> as opposed to something that you need. So I kind of went on eBay and just kind of wandered around, um, kind of looking at old boxing memorabilia and stuff because it just takes my interest in general. And um, I came across a ticket. It was a, a ticket from the third fight between Roberto Duran and Sugar Ray Leonard. And it was signed by both. And it was in a PSA slab. Now, at the time, I knew nothing about PSA. I knew nothing about grading. Just thought it looked mm -hmm. cool. Um, so in this case, I just said, you know, why not? Threw in an offer for it. Ended up buying it, and from there it just um, just spiraled <laughs> into the ticket world. Um, I suppose just kind of developed actually, an interest in it. Yeah, it's just very refreshing to hear a story like that because traditionally it might be uh, they went from sports cards to tickets, or potentially saw the price increase in tickets and found interest in it. So the fact that you kind of uh, just gravitated towards it naturally is very interesting. Um, and very cool. What were your initial thoughts on tickets then? Because a lot of people often complain about the eye appeal um, and often the fact that it's an old ticket. Who wants an old ticket? So what kind of what kind of gravitated you towards it when you first saw that ticket online? I, I think it was the eye appeal more so than, than anything. I, you'll find with, like say, boxing tickets, uh, especially the older ones, they tend to have quite a decent eye appeal. Um, so mm -hmm. in this case, I can show you the ticket there in a second. It has like the image of both fighters actually on it. Uh, as well so it's kind of it's visually striking um, by comparison to say some of those you know ticket master tickets that you see out there um, so that's just what it looks like so you can see like just based on what it what it looked like straight off I was like wow yeah. you know, that's that's really something boxing tickets do actually have that it's very interesting it's, they have that beautiful design kind of reminiscent of those Japanese uh, early movie tickets they have that popping design they've got the faces on that we can all kind of immediately establish and understand so I can definitely see how that caught your eye so when we look at your journey then from that one graded ticket where did it kind of all go wrong when did you begin to uh, <laughs> kind of pick up the collection and start upgrading um, I, th I think really where it came from was that I, I saw on eBay that tickets were selling for silly amounts of money um, and I kind of thought to myself I remember when I was a kid and I used to go to you know local football matches and stuff that I'd always keep my ticket afterwards it was just something that I did you know tickets and programs and that kind of stuff um, but just seeing the price that some of these things were selling for I was like that can't be right or it doesn't really make sense to me but kind of the more I got into it then I started looking on YouTube and then I came across the likes of the uh, Talking Tickets podcast and before you knew it like I was just glued uh, I saw one of the, the interviews that they did with Fav from a few years ago Mm -hmm. And I was just listening to the passion that everybody had for it. And before long, I was doing my own research and another ticket or two popped up. And before I knew it, I had maybe 20, 30 tickets and it just went <laughs> from there. So, yeah, ever since, I mean, here I am, what, maybe like nine, ten, almost a year later. And I have probably about, I'd say over 100 just sitting around right now. Well, um, I mean, is so, there a yeah. plan to grade them? Uh, there is a plan to grade them, yeah. I mean, I'm pretty bad for it because what tends to happen is I'll buy something and I'll say, right, this is going aside, this is going for grading. And before yeah. you know it, you have a pile of 10, 15, 20 things for grading, but there's always something else that comes up and your grading <laughs> budget tends to go into that. Um, so I keep pushing back and pushing back. I actually think we're all in the same boat there where we have a pile that is just continuously growing of probably quite valuable tickets kind of well for me specifically because it's growing so quickly i hope that psa will kind of have a grading offer and that price might come down five or ten dollars and then kind of it scales pretty nicely and as you say when you do have a budget and you're spending 20 30 dollars on grading 
as you know with tickets you can pick them up for five ten dollars it's like hang on is this really needed so yeah completely agree with you on that i've got an interesting uh, question on the back of that then often people that do collect things seem to have this very interesting I don't know, genetic deep, uh, <laughs> need to collect things and desire to hold memories. Have you collected things in the past beyond tickets? Uh, yeah, I suppose like a lot of us when I was younger, obviously when I was a kid, it would have been things like um, soccer tickets, or not even soccer tickets, but soccer stickers. Um, so it would have yeah. been the likes of the Premier League sticker book. Um, and that was just something that, again, for a lot of us, we probably did it as kids and probably have nostalgia for it. So I suppose it was that when I was a kid and then kind of when I was in yeah. my teens, when I was, as I've said, when I was going to matches and stuff, I'd collect the program and then I'd collect the ticket and I wouldn't really think about it. You know, you just kind of put it aside and then you discover it again years later. Um, but yeah, I kind of always had that about me where I'd always kind of just keep stuff um, for, for years and then kind of come back to it and kind of wonder why I still had it. Um, <laughs> but even outside of that. Uh, I took an interest in things like coins uh, a couple of years back and the likes of sovereigns and gold bullion coins and within that kind of space there's what they call numismatics um, so in other words kind of collector's coins or they have a collector value to them uh, and that's mm -hmm. an area that I kind of had an interest in so I suppose it kind of went from that to the, the whole ticket thing and they're all kind of similar in a sense you know different yeah. but still there's that kind of collector thing to it and the community around it exactly was there any tickets that you had then when you were younger that you kind of have revised back to and thought, you know what, they're pretty cool and, and then even checked and they have got some value or were you an unlucky chap who went to the bad games? Um, well, actually, it's, it's a really funny one. Uh, one of the games that I went to when I was younger was the um, debut of Cristiano Ronaldo for Real Madrid against Shamrock Rovers. And, no way, because um, of course it was in Ireland, wasn't it? It was, yeah, it was up in Tala at the time. And yeah. when I went up there, I actually didn't have the ticket purchased for it. Uh, I went up and just kind of looked to see was somebody selling their ticket. And lo and behold, somebody was. And I ended up buying it off them literally outside the gate that day. Um, so I went into the match, uh, sat beside this complete stranger who I'd never met <laughs> until that day. Um, saw the whole thing. And afterwards, just kept the ticket, kept the program for a few years. And when I was doing a clean out back around maybe 2015 2016 I was just cleaning out the apartment and mm -hmm. I sold uh, a pile of stuff so it would have been all old programs and old tickets and that was actually one of the ones that I sold at the time uh, and I thought to myself obviously after rediscovering it what a, a mistake to make right um, because I think I sold it for maybe 20 20 euros at the time something no. like that um, but then years later I was actually on a, a local flea market site called adverts.ie so that's kind of the, the main kind of gum tree alternative mm -hmm. uh, that we have in Ireland and when I was on there I saw that somebody was selling a, a programme and a ticket uh, from that particular game so immediately I was just like right I have to have that back in my collection um, so I ended up yeah. purchasing it from him um, but just to even think back to it, it's like, oh my God, you know, selling that for 20 euro six, seven years ago versus what you could probably get in the last couple of years was just uh, a massive mistake. But if you don't know, you don't know. Was there any significant uh, event that has happened in Ireland that you kind of have that uh, region advantage of where you can get access to these tickets a bit easier than people potentially outside the country um i suppose thinking back to like significant events i mean probably the, the likes of obviously that one for the the real madrid game uh ronaldo's debut yeah. um even outside of it i know that there was a fight between muhammad ali and i think it was uh, i can't think of the name of the guy he fought actually um but it was up in dublin um i think it was back in the 1970s i suppose generally because the fight was here that would be kind of easier to to access here um, but personally, not really. You know, I've not really had much luck finding um, tickets for events that were based in Ireland, uh, including the likes of boxing tickets. There's a, a very famous fight uh, that actually happened in Cork between uh, Steve Collins and Chris Eubank uh, back in the 1990s. They actually yeah. fought twice in Cork, and I've never been able to find a ticket um, from either of those two fights, even though they literally happened down the road from where I am. Um, so it just goes to show you, you know, maybe there's not as much of an advantage geographically <laughs> uh, then there there might otherwise be in other countries because we just probably don't have the collectors for that kind of thing, you know? Yeah, there is definitely a culture thing with different cultures across the world where they tend to keep things more, preserve things more. 
um, and appreciate that. So yeah, interesting to know that it's not so uh, easy in Ireland. Yeah. My staple uh, question to every collector that's been on the guest, and I think this one will be definitely relevant to you since you have a massively grown collection. What are three tickets that you would never sell? I was, I was actually thinking about this after I watched another episode. And um, honestly, I, I'm kind of of the thought that everything at the right price would be for sale. But mm-hmm. there's nothing that I really intend um, to sell. You know, there's nothing that I'd look at and say, yeah, 100%, that's up for sale. Um, but I suppose, just based on what I have here in front of me, probably the, the first ticket there that I purchased back in March, um, that's a series of fights, which I quite enjoy myself. So probably that ticket. Mm-hmm. Um, outside of that, not really as straightforward. Um, again, I have a few ones here that are graded. I ended up buying them graded. Um, they're nice tickets and everything, but if the right price ever came in, I'd probably sell them. Yeah. Um, Do you so want to show those one. off? It'll be interesting to see them. Yeah, sure. Um, so two seconds. So I have everything and anything on the table right now. Um, so some of these are kind of classic. Some of them kind of more modern. Um, so this one here is from the first fight uh, between Roberto Duran and Sugar Ray Leonard. Um, yeah. So in this case, I ended up buying the ticket while it was graded. So it's just uh, graded as an authentic, I believe. Um, but for me personally, I'm not big on kind of grading numbers anyway. Um, so it's just okay. something to have. Um, but that's one of them. Um, outside of that, there's another one here. Um, so it's Sugar Ray Leonard versus Thomas Hearns. So that would have been the first fight that they had, uh, which would be considered a classic. Um, yeah. So again, that's a, a PSA 9 uh, in this case. And again, with the artwork, like the artwork on that, I believe, is by the artist Leroy Neiman. So you see a lot of his work on old boxing tickets, and it's it's just okay. really, really hard to beat that, you know? Yeah, uh, especially when you see the, the modern stuff, <laughs> where it's quite literally just Ticketmaster, and that's all you're getting. Yeah, that's really cool. They're very, they're very, the IP is uh, much better than some of the old uh, football tickets. There's very clear, distinct faces, and I guess... It's a bit easier to understand who might be playing because it's a, a boxing match, whereas football or potentially other sports, you don't entirely know until before. And uh, yeah, pretty cool. Have you ever ventured into other sports outside boxing and specifically which ones? Um, so it would have been a little bit of football. Um, again, just a few like Arsenal tickets because I'm an Arsenal supporter. Um, yeah. Again, nothing really major. Um even outside of that there would have been a few things like concert tickets uh, that I picked up uh, so up until recently I owned a Live Aid ticket um, from the, the UK Live Aid uh, not in great condition or anything but again nice little keepsake to have um, yeah. even outside of that there was another one that I bought which was um, a ticket from a, a visit to the World Trade Center from the summer of 2001 a little bit morbid okay. um, but visually kind of a, a nice ticket and I suppose uh, a nice Quite a long sake. skinny ticket, isn't it? It is, yeah. You'd see a lot of them kind of pop up graded mostly. Um, but in this case, I actually asked the guy, I was like, where did you get the ticket from? Because I was buying mm-hmm. it from France. And it turns out the guy had something like five of them. And they were all kind of voucher oh. tickets. Um, so there was, no, there was no actual price on them. I think it was part of some deal that they got uh, as part of the, the holiday makers that they went through in order to, to go to New York. Um, but it was in perfect condition so I was like okay so I ended up buying it off of him um, but it's little things like that as it you know there's no rhyme or reason as to why I might purchase something like that other than that I thought it was kind of cool and uh, that's about it I've got an interesting story about the World Trade Center I think it would have been about probably six months ago and one of the tickets was listed from the World Trade Center to go obviously go up and have a look from the viewing area and I think it was like three days before two three days before and I saw it pop up and I bought it and immediately I felt a weird sense of like something and I was calling my friends and my family is like you know what is this weird is this like unusual do I plan to keep this because I think it's a cool ticket or do I plan to sell it and I, I questioned that and I was like you know what the idea really with this one is to make profit on it and then to make profit on a, an event like that just felt a little bit you know it was a bit distant to what kind of got me into tickets, which is collecting memories that I love rather than popular memories. And it's, yeah, that kind of played on my mind. And I messaged the guy saying, you know, please can I refund this? And he did. He gave me a refund before he shipped it. So, yeah, an interesting story about that one. But, yeah, 
disasters like that are obviously memorable moments in time and that's what we do collect but with the idea of making profit for some reason it just didn't sit entirely right with me however with that said something like the titanic and i know that was mentioned on the discord for some reason would would be a really interesting ticket to have um and I, I think that's a little i don't know maybe a bit different i don't know what are your thoughts on that um i mean if somebody offered it to me in the morning for a hundred dollars it would be bought <laughs> regardless yeah. of you know the story behind it but I, I think at the same time there's always going to be kind of a, a bit of a, a sense of should i really have this um even would say as i said the, the world trade center tickets it's it's so grim to, to really think about you know what it kind of signifies um, that it is kind of a, a strange piece in that sense, but it's it's the same, I suppose, with the the tickets that went up last year. Was it from the Abraham Lincoln assassination? Yes. Um, I mean, historically super significant, but still kind of a, a strange ticket to have because of what that significance is. Um, thankfully enough, I don't think I own any uh, boxing tickets that are kind of known for their their tragedies. Maybe one or two actually. Now to think of it, but. Um, again, not obviously on the level of you know a nine eleven or a Titanic um, kind of scenario. Yeah. Very interesting. So, with tickets kind of always taking new avenues, and we're always finding potentially cheaper alternatives or fun tickets to collect that haven't been found or discovered before. What are, if you don't mind me asking, what are some avenues that you've re- recently ventured into, or things that aren't so popular but you found cool? Um, Well, I suppose just in terms of how I've gone about finding tickets, I haven't really ventured onto the likes of Facebook groups yet, um, simply because I just don't like using Facebook. So I'm probably missing out in that sense. Um, But usually you're talking kind of flea market sites in different countries uh, tends to be the way to go if you want to get a a decently priced kind of difficult ticket, Um, particularly Japan. I find myself going on Mercari an awful lot and end up using Google Translate and that to find what I need. Um, but that's been fruitful. That's that's worked for me um, several times. So Japanese boxing tickets um, is about as niche as it probably gets um, for me. Um, but again, when it comes to it, that's that's probably something kind of cool that I found from you know going through those different uh, different avenues. Uh, outside of that, I'm just like everybody else. I have my save searches on eBay that I'm constantly looking yeah. at. Use sites like um, PickClick. I don't know if you've ever heard of that one. It's basically just... I be, yeah, uh, I believe so, I have. Yeah, it's it's just an easier way of going through eBay, I find, because I don't always find what I'm looking for just using eBay searches, but I find that that tends to be, you know, pretty decent um, for, for finding thing, it quicker. Actually. Yeah. Um, outside of that, in Ireland, <laughs> adverts.ie. Not that it's been too too lucky for me, but at the same time, it's, it's still there. You never know what might go up. Yeah. How often do your uh, eBay notifications ping? Because I've got around, probably about 15 saved. And it's been three months since any of them have kind of come up with anything that <laughs> I'm actually after. How often, are you a bit more lucky than me or not? Um, being honest, my eBay save searches, I don't know, is it just my keyword optimization or whatnot, but um, they don't ping for me. They really don't. Um, really? I tend to find I, I tend to find things that I'm looking for using the likes of pick click or just searching generally on eBay. I find that when I do get a, a ping through one of my save searches, it's something that I've already probably seen already. Um, mm-hmm. So they haven't been as useful. That's probably down to how I use them. Um, but that being said, I find that the, the best finds that I've had are just one of those scenarios where you're on your phone for five minutes at 12 o'clock at night and you refresh and there it is. Uh, out of yeah. nowhere um, so yeah as it probably doesn't ping as much for me as it might for some people I don't know but something about your eyesight and a bit of luck at night always past midnight you seem to get an extra bit of luck and something <laughs> pops up that you probably had a filter set for and it just is there labelled differently with a potentially a different date or in a bundle and you get lucky I've always found you know what I'm, I'm probably the same there as well yeah, it's, it's, it's a funny one. It's, it tends to be as well avenues that you usually wouldn't go down. Um, like for me, there was there was a ticket that I ended up buying from Etsy of all places. Um, now Etsy, fantastic site if you want to buy you know a customised knitting basket for your mother-in-law. Um, probably not the place to go looking for rare tickets um, because everything that's on there tends to be like reproduction or art pieces or, you know, so have you. But um yeah. In this case, it was a ticket from the, the opening of the 1996 Olympic Games. 
and it was seemingly signed by Muhammad Ali. Um, and I ended up having a chat with the guy. I was like, look, there's so many Ali fakes and stuff out there. You know, can you tell me the story behind how you managed to obtain this? And seemingly... Yeah. He said that he had it for the best part of 30 years. The ticket itself isn't in great condition, um, but he was saying that there was a signing, I think, back in 1997 in his area um, through TriStar, I believe it was. And he was saying that basically he got Ali to sign it uh, through that. So at the time, I mean, it was a good price on the ticket and stuff. So I said, right, um, I was probably going to buy it anyway and just chance it. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. But I ended up going through all those quick opinion services on the signature. Um, mm-hmm. So I sent it into I think it was like the PSA Quick Opinion. I think there was a, is it a GSA Quick Opinion is out there as well. And then there was another guy who's like a specialist in uh, Muhammad Ali autographs. And okay. I ended up getting back a response of like one was like it might be legit or it is likely legit. And I think the other one was saying that it's it's most likely not. And then the third just came back no answer. Um, so I had nothing to really base it off of. So I just bought it off the guy anyway. And I've still yet to grade it. And this will probably come back to bite me in the ass in the future. It's probably as fake as it gets. Uh, but we will find out at some point um, from PSA. But there it is. Um, from what I've done research-wise, the signature kind of matches up for the, the era that it's from. Um, yeah. Obviously, with Ali's Parkinson's and stuff, his signature became less mm-hmm. and less extravagant as he got older. Um, and I've seen the exemplars for that time. So it seemed to match up to me. As I said, it's probably as, as fake as it gets. We'll find out at some <laughs> point. Um but again, that's one that I've just put aside. I should really send it to grading, but you know, it's a it's a what if until then. Yeah, there's definitely a certain prices where you think, is this worth it? And you reflect and kind of think, if it isn't, I'm happy to lose that. If it is, it's a great success. So I wish you the best of luck. Hopefully, uh, <laughs> hopefully it is like is legit, and you know, you get it in a nice slab. Yeah, um, again, like with that one, it's one of those where, yeah, I paid a couple of hundred for it, but, you know, something I could I could laugh at it if it came back as not being legit. <laughs> you know, maybe it's a bit of a, a learning curve. I haven't seen many Ali autographs at all, actually. Must, was it a quite a difficult one to get access to? I, I haven't done too much research into it. Um, it it kind of depends, I suppose. When it comes to the likes of Ali, you'll find that his signature is out there on pretty much everything you can think of. Um, mostly the likes of religious pamphlets of all things um, because apparently as he got older because he couldn't sign he used to pre-sign a bunch of these so if somebody approached him in public looking for his signature he'd just hand him one of these these leaflets with his signature on it um, so you find a lot of those on eBay going for usually about 100 or 200 quid um, yeah. but outside of that ticket wise I've seen his signature on some strange ones like CCTV tickets you know the closed circuit tickets um, <laughs> Yeah, it just seems like if you had access at the time to Muhammad Ali, a CCTV ticket, probably not what you want signed by him. But yeah, I've seen a few of them out there. Um, there's a few obviously graded by PSA as well. Um, and they're also kind of Olympics tickets from the same kind of era. Um, so mm-hmm. it'd be interesting to see what comes of it. Not that there's any authentication at all. And obviously don't quote me on this, but there is kind of some sense of like ease when you know it's a pretty used ticket. Not on necessarily the the authentication of the autograph, but more the ticket itself. If it has got wear and you can kind of tell that that wear is a little bit older and it was done maybe at least 10 years ago, then you know that, okay, it, if it is a fake, it was done 10 years ago, how likely would someone fake this ticket 10 years ago? You get the path on. So it is a sense of like, oh, this could be legit rather than a reprint. Yeah, it's kind of a, a fingers crossed scenario. Uh, there's a few that I have like that as well that have age on them, um, and I, it's because of the age that you're there looking at it, saying I I know inherently this is legit, just because of how badly kept it is. Um, so I suppose there's that kind of relief as well. It'll probably get a PSA one in some cases, but at the same time, still kind of nice to have. That's definitely all part of the excitement. And grading is definitely becoming more and more important than ever. There is more tickets on the market now than we've ever had. Obviously, a lot of new collectors coming into the market. So it is the easiest way to differentiate one ticket from another and have that premium price value. So, yeah, a lot of authentic ticket collectors, such as yourself, that have kind of found it naturally, will tend to care less about it. But it is those that have kind of transitioned in from sports cards that really appreciate the higher grades. 
Yeah, even like one thing I've I've seen a lot of, and I, I think I threw a question into the Discord maybe a few months ago about it, just to get people's opinions. Um, but even when it comes to the likes of the difference between, say, tickets and passes for an event, I've never understood the price kind of disparity between the two of them. Um, because for boxing, you'll find an awful lot of the time kind of VIP or media passes come up. Mm-hmm. And it could be to a fight where the ticket you maybe have never seen or the ticket usually goes for a couple of hundred dollars. Uh, whereas you can sometimes get the pass for like 20, 30 dollars for yeah. the same fight. And the way I look at it is, you know, if, if somebody was in attendance, uh, which they would have been having a pass like that, how is it really any different from a ticket? Uh, I don't really see a difference myself, but I know for other people there there might be you know a, a difference for it. Um, but it's been something that's been very very lucky for me. Um, again, a couple of passes that I'm after getting in the last you know a couple of months will be the likes of this one. Um, it's from Mike Tyson's last professional fight against Kevin McBride. That's I've a really the, cool one. It's it's a funny one really because I've I've seen the ticket for that maybe twice, and that's only through doing research. And I think in both cases, it went for like a couple of hundred dollars. I certainly didn't pay yeah. a couple of hundred dollars for that. Um, and it was relatively easy to find. Um, the same with a few others. Um, I just have a pass on hand for Mayweather versus Pacquiao. Again, it's the likes of a, a VIP a really cool pass. It, yeah, it has that eye really appeal cool. uh, for sure, you know. Um, again, Absolutely, and passes do tend to have that. Passes do have a bit more extra effort. The faces are more likely to be on it. It might have a design or artwork kind of difference to the other ones. For me, my perspective is, uh, maybe I'm a bit traditional here, but the ticket will always come over the pass just because I'm a ticket collector. So ultimately, it's the paper that you want to hold. And often, or sometimes, they tend to be a bit more rare. So it's cool to have. But yeah, I don't know. There is something about tickets which I have a, a focus on rather than passes. I'm not sure why. But I do believe as things change and tickets become less available and we have e-tickets and VIP passes or ringside passes or player edition passes become more popular or the only thing we can get our hands on I do think then that might change the culture overall about uh, the consensus on passes but yeah they are a cheap alternative at the moment whether that changes or not I'm who knows yeah yeah again I suppose just one example even when it comes to the likes of football Obviously, there was Messi's um, debut for Inter Miami. Uh, the passes from that game, I think, were all that was yeah. really available for it. So I suppose when it's mm-hmm. the only alternative, that's where I think people kind of see the value in it more so. Um, but Absolutely. generally, as I said, I've seen with most people, it's ticket first, then the pass. Whereas for myself, it's the ticket, the pass, you know, whatever. They were all there at the time. Yeah. The thing is with passes is not all. they don't always have seat numbers. I think that's one of the things. Some of them are a bit uh, unsure on whether they're actually granted access. I think that bl- definitely plays a role. Did it give backside ring outside, uh, sorry, ringside access or did it give backstage access? These are some of the things. And then sometimes you needed the pass with a ticket. So the, the, the pass kind of doesn't grant access. So it's not valid for entry. So there's different nuances that aren't so clear with the passes, which might be potentially why they're not as valuable. Yeah, yeah. Again, I suppose wherever there's any sort of confusion surrounding it, that's where it kind of puts people off. Um, as a keepsake, it's still nice to have all the same, you know, as a collector. Um, but I have seen that in a few cases where it could even be a pass that potentially belonged to somebody who was involved in the event, you know, even in the ring in some cases when it comes to the likes of uh, boxing. But there's no way of really proving it unless obviously you have a, a exactly. picture of the person wearing the pass, you know. So it can be difficult. So interestingly on that note about tennis, every tennis player when they enter these events will get given a pass and it's often laminated or a card and it's kind of just strapped around the back of their bag. When they enter the arena, it will always be documented on TV or on YouTube with them coming in with this pass. So you know straight away that it's authentic. So if you can kind of match it up to that, then there's proof that that gave access and then of course that it's authentic or not. So. Yeah, if it has got proof in that way, it's, it's obviously fantastic. But again, they're difficult to authenticate. I know a lot of early Michael Jackson concerts had passes, but they had no next to no information on at all. So, you know, it might have to be handwritten on with a name and a date. And again, then it's not uh, potentially gradable with PSA when it's got the handwriting on. Yeah, yeah, I've seen, I've seen that as well with a few boxing passes where it'll be the likes of, say, a press pass. 
but the actual seat number then is actually written on the paper that's been laminated so it's, again nice keepsake but it's it's never really going to get authenticated yeah exactly as a as a boxing fan and, and that being the the main premise of your collection i wanted to know for you what's kind of more important a debut fight or a, a last fight because in terms of awareness and significance well sorry not so much significance but awareness the last fight is obviously very memorable in boxing what what is more important for you a debut or a last fight um honestly i i suppose the debut um because when it comes to the last fight unfortunately in a lot of cases you know you're you're talking about them probably not performing at their best or being quite quite a bit past their best um like even as i said there with the tyson pass he ended up getting knocked out in that fight against mcbride probably one of his worst ever performances um so in terms of significance i suppose it's significant that it ended his career but would i rather have say a ticket from his debut 100 percent um even though the debut in a lot of cases probably isn't as as heralded or as kind of you know as big a deal because in some cases they don't know whether or not the guy's going to go on to be successful um Mm -hmm. it's all kind of speculative um but again sometimes as well with boxing because you have the likes of the olympics the debut can be seriously hyped um, because maybe you're talking about a gold medalist you know um, so it just depends but for me personally it would be debut um, I suppose holding that value as opposed to the uh, the final fight yeah and I've seen you add some on the discord about debuts and stuff and it's very interesting but I think what's interesting about boxing ticket collectors is they do go for those big moments it is the when we look at Clay it's the thriller in Manila it's the rumble in the jungle it's those fights it's not the Ali debut so 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 much or the last fight it is the key moments in his career which is isn't really the case or isn't as much of the case for soccer when you look at some top goals from Messi or Cristiano Ronaldo there's a there's a, a massive focus on debuts for those players whereas boxing the culture is slightly different yeah it, it certainly is I suppose it, it comes down to what was the uh, the iconic fights of that person's career um, because very often the iconic fights are certainly not the first or the last ones you know it tends to be whatever came in between in their prime yeah. um, but funnily enough one thing I've seen with, with boxing tickets where there's kind of a comparison in the likes of football um, would be that I know in, in football you have the Messi Porto ticket uh, mm-hmm. that we always see absolutely everywhere uh, to the point that it's almost nauseating in boxing there's the Ali Liston ticket um, yeah. where seemingly there just seems to be this massive oversupply of this ticket yeah. now I know historically I think there was only something like half of uh, the capacity of the stadium in there at the time I think it was only maybe mm-hmm. 2,300 and maybe a four or 5,000 seater stadium um, but at the same time you just see so many of these that you do Absolutely. start to really question the authenticity of them um, like even personally I have one right here um, only bought it for you know, not very much, if I'm honest. Um, but at the same time, when you, even when you see them graded, they go for like three, four hundred dollars, and it's a, a, an amazing fight. You know, super significant uh, in Ali's career and in the, the history of boxing. Um, but at the same time, there's just such a, a surplus of them out there. Um, but I suppose from the other perspective, it's a great kind of uh, gateway ticket. You know, for somebody who's maybe coming from the kind of cards background or who's just mm-hmm. getting into tickets in general, it's affordable it's recognisable, it's iconic in its own right, you know, so I suppose in many ways it's the uh, the messy porto of boxing. <laughs> it, is the, it is the equivalent, that's very interesting because, and I know Eric mentioned this in a previous episode about kind of aligning specific uh, photography to specific events. Of course that fight had the, the memory that we all know very clearly of, um, I believe it's listening on the floor and then Arnie looking over him as a, as a huge figure. And I believe that was taken at that fight. And that obviously gives it that additional sense of excitement. And I think on top of that, was it his first flight? Sorry, first fight as Clay? Uh, so it was his first fight, yeah, as Muhammad Ali. Um, so previously, before that, he was uh, Cassius Clay. Um, but sorry, in the time in between. That's what I was talking about. First fight as uh, Muhammad Ali. Yeah, yeah. So in the time in between, he discovered Islam and changed his name to Muhammad yeah. Ali. So that that's the significance of it. Also, it was the, the fight that had the phantom punch. Um, where seemingly nobody saw the punch that connected with Liston that led to him going to the canvas. Um, so to this day, many people still believe that that fight was actually a fix. Um, <laughs> so there's, there's all sorts of controversy just surrounding that one fight. Um, and I suppose the ticket kind of is iconic for that reason. 
you know, there's so much that happened. There's that amazing image, as you mentioned, of Ali yep. shouting at Liston. Um, and he's actually telling him to get up. Um, and then, of course, there's the whole issue with the referee in that fight as well, where he didn't actually count correctly because he ended up getting distracted trying to pull Ali away from Liston, uh, thinking that he was going to actually continue attacking him even when he was on the canvas. Um, so it's it's super controversial, you know, ridiculously so. There we go. Well, we mentioned the Porto debut. I know it's, it's probably been mentioned in every episode, but that is the gateway drug into soccer collecting and messy collecting, if that's what you're interested in. There you go, guys. That is the that is the boxing <laughs> gateway drug. So if you do want to find that avenue, it seems like the uh, Liston Ali ticket is the one to start it with. Yeah, and like I say, uh, it's pretty affordable and it's readily available and it's very significant. Yeah, I'd I'd be surprised if you could go on eBay literally any day of the year and not be able to find one for like two or three hundred dollars. Like they're just ubiquitous. They're absolutely everywhere. And even the amount graded is something silly. If you go on the pop report, it's just absolutely Isn't that hundreds. L- yeah, literally hundreds of them. Um, and yeah, then they come in about color variations, and they had different prices, and they got you access into different parts. I know there's ones where it was like a screening of it, or potentially like backstage or something where you can't actually see it. So that's something to be cautious of. But each different color represents a different area, I believe, and there are lots and lots out there. Yeah, that's that's the thing. I, I've seen it on other podcasts and that where people do mention it. I think it was in one of the, the one of the top one hundred tickets. It was deemed to be, but there's so many people that have them that it's kind of it's lost its value. I suppose if we're honest. Um, but at the same time, it's a cool keepsake, and it's something that if someone sees it, they'll they'll start a conversation about it. Um, like even before Christmas, actually, I was talking to a friend of mine about ticket collecting. And he was just kind of saying to me, because he's not really a sports guy, he was saying, like, I don't really get it. You know, you're, you're collecting pieces of cardboard for yeah. hundreds of dollars. Like, this sounds really, <laughs> really strange. And it wasn't until I kind of mentioned to him that you can get, like, music tickets as well that are, you know, seriously significant. The likes of the, the Woodstock ticket would be another one. Uh, where I suppose for a music collector, that's probably their equivalent of Messi Porto or Ali Liston, um, because there's so many of them out there and they're so readily yeah. available. But it was funny, even just showing him a, a Woodstock ticket, he was like, wow, that's seriously cool. You know, that's something that I could see myself actually buying. You know, so from his perspective, it just goes to show you, you know, it doesn't have to be the super rare tickets. It just kind of has to be a, a conversation piece to get somebody interested. Absolutely. And I think that's why ticket collecting is actually so fun, because when we look at, I don't know, a traditional sports card collector, they're all in with their sports, so all in on American football, all in on basketball, all in on baseball. But with ticket collecting, you're collecting anything that's ever been ticketed throughout time. So it could be pretty much anything. And I definitely started with soccer, but then I moved into F1 and my eBay filters opened up to just ticket or tickets or whatever it may be. And that then automatically puts you on the spectrum for anything, any ticket that has ever kind of happened. And you do begin to appreciate tickets and the encapsulation of that time and I've since gone on to buy music tickets like you say um, sports tickets, F1 which I'm not particularly interested in but I do now find it interesting through the collecting of tickets so yeah as you say it kind of uh, ticket collecting is an easy hobby to enter in for the fact that you only have to spark someone's imagination with one ticket whether it be you know the Liston fight or whether it be Messi Porto debut that is it that can that can be the gateway drug and then your mind is open to hang on this isn't just a weirdo collecting paper that's very expensive it's now okay cool this is a great way to catch that memory and he's not as weird as i initially thought yeah it's it's funny i think with almost any other collectible you could probably somewhat justify it um yeah. but yeah just on face value you know you're you are really collecting pieces of cardboard albeit decorative pieces of cardboard um, but yeah it's it's fascinating I mean I even see it um, with other people where they, they see a ticket and they, they'll want to know the story behind it even if they're not interested in the sport just because maybe it has that eye appeal to it um, so it's fascinating in that sense I think I've got to the point now where I've accumulated so many raw tickets that I've even forgot when I look at some of them what they actually mean so I have to go and redo research and understand like oh okay that was so and so's debut or that was uh, someone's first goal or whatever it may be so I need to probably start documenting that a bit better but yeah you're right
I wanted to know then, one of the questions I had on my list was some of your most recent pickups. Uh, what are kind of three tickets you've bought most recently that kind of fascinate you and for what reason? Um, so yeah, even at the start of the year there, there was uh, quite a few pickups in the space of maybe three or four days. Um, so there was mm -hmm. a guy on eBay that was basically selling an entire boxing collection um, piece by piece. So I suppose some of the more interesting ones that I picked up um, would be the, the likes of the Foreman versus Moorer ticket. Um, so for those who know, it's um, a fight from 1994 um, between um, George Foreman and uh, Michael Moore, who at the time was the world heavyweight champion. Now it's famous for the fact that Foreman had come out of retirement after 20 odd years um, to try to become the heavyweight champion in his 40s. Um, so he wasn't yeah. quite the same George Foreman. <laughs> he was a little bit uh, round around the middle um, and obviously 20 years older. But in the Moore fight, he was losing it pretty much the entire way through because he just couldn't keep up the pace. Um, but eventually he ended up actually knocking out Michael Moore to become the, whole, uh, the oldest heavyweight champion in history um, at 45 years old. Um, so that was a, a nice pickup. Um, a really significant event and I suppose in a boxing history standpoint it doesn't get much better than that um, so that was one that I picked up recently and it was graded um, even outside of that there would have been um, a dressing room pass it's it's actually a phantom pass because it wouldn't have been valid for entry uh, because yeah. the, the fight was pushed back but it was between Ali and Liston but it was for the initial date of their second fight um, which was supposed to be I think it was December of 64 I think it was it could be wrong on my dates but it got pushed back to uh, May of 65 but this dressing room pass was only valid for if the fight had happened in 64 but for the price okay. that I found it at I ended up buying it anyway as a collector yeah. just a, a nice little kind of keepsake um, and then even outside of that um, even today I purchased a, a ticket from the fight between um, Floyd Mayweather and Arturo Gatti again one of the, the mm -hmm. many Hall of Famers uh, that Floyd Mayweather would have beaten it's one of those tickets it does come up from time to time uh, in fact one only came up about three weeks ago and then I actually missed out on that one and then it came up again last night so I jumped on it um, but yeah those would be the, the three recent pickups that I've had um, probably you know not the, the rarest in some cases um, mm -hmm. but they all have a story behind them at least you know they're all kind of fascinating in their own right yeah you mentioned actually that you bought a lot in one period I definitely find that when I buy tickets that they come in waves. I might not find something for a week or a week and a half, two weeks, and then one day will come and, you know, three in three days. So it is kind of just staying on the ball and, and luck will happen. Yeah, yeah I, th I think the biggest part of that as well can be that if there's, you know, three or four or five things come up that you've actually been looking for for a while, the, the mm -hmm. FOMO starts to kick in um, and you start thinking to yourself, right, <laughs> yeah. am I just going to buy you know, the three or four or five of them outright or am I going to wait for another opportunity for them to come up? And I think when it comes down to it, probably the, the cure to FOMO is research. Um, the more that you know about the ticket, the more that you know about how often it tends to pop up, the less likely you are to, to probably mm -hmm. overspend really. Um, so I find that that does help, you know, using the likes of 130 points or uh, TerraPeak. Um, yeah. doing the, the product research through eBay you'll find that the same ticket probably came up you know 10, 15 times in 2 or 3 years if it did yeah. it's 100% going to come up again um, so that tends to be something that I kind of rely on during those times where a lot of stuff just comes up at the same time just see how, how often it kind of comes out and if it's frequent you'll probably find it again I know there's a lot of investors listening to the podcast and I've had a lot of messages about you know, with the price go up, et cetera, et cetera. And obviously I'm not the judge of that, but some of them find interesting stories about potentially cheap pickups that you've, or the, our guests have made that they then have a lot more value. I know you don't tend, send, tend to sell too many tickets, but what are some tickets you've bought that are particularly cheap that now are quite well valued? Um, well, I think in terms of being well valued now, maybe not so much. Being um, prospectively worth quite a bit more in the future, uh, I do have a few like that. Um, I actually have a few of them with me. Um, so there's actually two of these here that I bought from Japan. Um, so this one, if you can see it, is the boxing debut of Tenshin Nasukawa. Um, so he's quite famous as a kickboxer. He's considered one of the, the best of all time in that particular field. Um, but he's kind of more well known to Westerners for his exhibition fight loss to Floyd Mayweather. 
um, a couple of years back and the fact that after the fight he actually started crying in the ring uh, not a great look for him uh, especially considering <laughs> that in kickboxing he was somehow undefeated he's an absolute beast uh, when it comes to it um, but since he switched over to, to boxing there's a lot of kind of hype around him as to what will he be able to do um, so again that's one that I kind of have my eye on at the moment just to see where his career goes if he ends up as an all time great who knows you know maybe it'll be a difficult ticket to find in the future with a bit of value to it mm-hmm. um, maybe he'll get beaten in his next fight who knows but again that's one of those that I'd say is very much uh, speculative um, similar as well another Japanese boxing ticket um, this one is from a recent fight um, between Neoya and Nui and Marilyn Tapales. Um, so I don't know if you're familiar with Inoue's career, but he's the first ever uh, Japanese boxer to be rated pound for pound number one by The Ring magazine, uh, which was quite significant. He's also the first Japanese boxer to be on the cover of The Ring magazine, which would again be very highly respected in boxing circles. But in that particular fight, he actually unified his second division in only a year. Now, it just so happens uh-huh. if he did this a few years back, it would have been seriously significant and unbelievable. Uh, but he happened to do it in the same year as another boxer, Terence Crawford, uh, who did the exact same thing by unifying in two divisions. Um, so again, yeah. not to take away his achievement, but it was a big fight. It was seriously significant what he managed to achieve. And again, maybe in the future, you know, there might be, a, I suppose, a serious spike in uh, in value for that ticket. But again, remains to be seen. You know, it comes down to how many people were there for the event as well. Which in this case, I think it was something like maybe twelve, thirteen thousand. So you kind of have a significant amount of people. Um, so mm-hmm. again, just depends. Um, even outside of that, one that I think is hugely undervalued, um, and I don't know if it will go up in value in the future. If I'm honest, is this one. Um, so it's from the fight between Lennox Lewis and Frank Bruno, but that's not what's I've significant. Uh, yeah, so you've probably seen the story behind it as well, uh, with it being the professional debut for Joe Calzaghe. Um, again, Calzaghe from a, a European perspective, you know, quite well respected. From an American perspective, maybe not so much because he didn't really fight there very much. It was only towards the end of his career, really. Um, so again, you know, in terms of the the value for it, you know, as a European boxing collector, you'd probably see it as something significant. In the US, maybe not so much. Yeah. You mentioned then about Japanese, and I find that really interesting because collecting things come in waves, and I know at the moment from speaking a lot of sellers, Chinese buyers are coming in and buying a lot of tickets, which is obviously interesting to see. And that is often the case and will probably likely happen as well with Japanese stuff. So kind of putting yourself in that perspective of a year's time or two years' time or whenever it may be, when these Japanese buyers come in with quite big pockets, then it's kind of anticipating what they will collect what they will gravitate towards and then potentially that spike will happen and then it's probably a good window to sell yeah definitely i, I think i suppose more so with japan they have a, a history when it comes to collectibles um so it's more of a thing there yeah. whereas obviously i was listening to the podcast recently you were saying that you purchased those um those tickets for like the first for a chinese player in the premier league or yeah you know these i reckon long term kind of speculatively you know, once there's more of a, a market in China for these things, I'd assume they'll blow up at some point. Um, yeah, definitely. And as you mentioned about Japanese collectibles, of course they've got Pokemon, but I know they have a lot of things. That, that's which is why a lot of their movie tickets are kind of souvenirs, uh, which they like to keep. And just throughout time, their culture seems to hold on to things a lot more. They've got a lot of flea markets over there where design items are kept. So yeah, maybe as a speculation that. That could be a great buy. So if anyone's listening and they are wanting to take a risk, who knows, that might be a, a nice avenue to, to look into. On, and it doesn't have to be for boxing. It could be with anything. It could be the first Japanese player, like I say, in the Premier League, or it could be Japanese players worldwide or historical Japanese figures, uh, boxing, WWE. There's so many different avenues to look and tackle. Yeah. Yeah, again, when it comes down to it, that's the, the beauty of tickets as well. You know, again, going through the likes of the the Japanese flea market sites, what I often find is I'll find tickets for events that I know nothing of, and then I'll end up doing research on those. Yeah. Um. So yeah. before you know it, you've spent two or three hours using Google Translate to find out what is the significance of this. Um. But again, that's that's something I love about the hobby in general. You know, I find that I have a kind of a natural interest in just researching stuff. You know, I never kind of half-ass it. <laughs> Uh, I like just reading uh, and just having the opportunity to learn about something new. So I think in terms of the hobby itself, 
it's ideal for somebody that's like that that just wants to find out more agree. yeah and i find that's where all the excitement comes and from a financial perspective you might do hours and hours of research for one ticket it might be three four five hours of research for one ticket and yes it's a lot of fun but from a financial perspective you're best off working a normal job earning the money than just buying it for whatever price it pops up at from a financial and time perspective but like i say that's not where the fun comes from but if someone does have you know a lot of money they're much better off just buying it than doing the research themselves and that's why i think in some aspects tickets are quite underpriced because you've got to look at like the the hunting costs and you look at fossils for example as a collectible there's all the the uh, the costs of you know you've got to buy a site you've got to go into the limestone you've got to get permission these are costs that are kind of put into the tickets as sorry the, the fossils as they get sold you've got to contribute for uh, preparation and things like that so with tickets you've got to put that in with time so many hours have got to go into researching and understanding what that moment was why it was significant and then even kind of down to getting the right thing on the slab and on the flip of the PSA label because if you label it wrong and don't tell the story too well then it's not going to sell but if you can twist the narrative that's cool and interesting and build a storyline towards that then I think you can do quite well yeah uh, 100% I think an awful lot of the time the, the kind of joy for us as collectors as well kind of comes from you know, you'd see it there in the, the likes of the Discord when you're putting up a, a ticket that no one's ever seen before. But then you're you're yeah. also explaining the story behind it. Um, I think that's where we all kind of get a kick at times where we found something that there's not really any obvious significance behind it. But once you do your research, there's something there, you know. Uh, and that's happened for me countless times, just going on there and seeing what other people have put up and just thinking, wow, yeah. you know, I <laughs> never knew that or didn't know about this event or I didn't know why that was significant. And before you know it, you're out there seeking the same thing on eBay. Or, Absolutely. You know. Absolutely. And, there, and on the flip side of that, there is the, the opposite, which is a group of individuals which want to give value to anything. And it could be the it could be something ridiculous like oh it's the first time they blink 200 times in, in a game <laughs> or something stupid like that or the first time I don't know the seventh home debut or something stupid or ridiculous like that so yeah it is a there is a fine line between finding stories that weren't particularly uncovered or well reported or documented versus absolute nonsense yeah yeah and you do see a lot of that as well the, the absolute nonsense tickets yeah. um, again especially for I think the other day there was a ticket there that went into the discord it was like john lennon meets paul mccartney at some sports event or something it was absolutely bizarre whatever the the connection there was but uh somebody managed to get it put on a, a flip by the looks of it yeah so yeah um again there'll always be tickets like that um and yeah you can't disrespect it if that's what someone yeah. collects and if that's what they want if they're doing a financial gain then that's a different thing because again it's a bit weird and no one really wants it but if someone wants it then that's fine and that's why I like ticket collecting because you can't tell someone what they like you can't say oh don't buy this or I don't like friendly debuts because that's their decision if they've decided they want that then then let it be you can't let your own opinions kind of dictate and uh, have an impact on what other people like yeah ex exactly um, even in terms of like sometimes you'll, you'll find yourself even buying a, a graded ticket where you look at the, the flip on it and the flip isn't actually, you know, kind of dedicated to the most significant thing about that event. Um, mm -hmm. I've actually had that experience recently. There was a, a ticket that I bought that I have on hand and it's from a fight between uh, Lomachenko versus Regan Dow. And again, bought it for very little. The flip just says that it's a fight between those two particular uh, boxers. But the significance mm -hmm. of the ticket is more than that. It's actually the first time that in professional boxing two double Olympic gold medalists had actually faced each other. Uh, it's the okay. only time it's ever happened. Um, incredibly unusual that that would happen because it would mean that in both cases they went to the Olympics twice and in both cases yeah. they won gold and they probably, if it was around the same time, they were probably in different weight divisions as well. Yeah. So they somehow didn't clash with each other. Um, so mm -hmm. I thought it was amazing when I did the research on it. I was like, okay, that's far more significant than I ever thought it would have been. Um, but Definitely. again, the flip doesn't reflect that. So maybe that's one for, you know, regrading or reholstering at some point in the future. Yeah, and I think with PSA, they often go with whoever submits it first. Hopefully that will change and the, the culture will change where you can have something a little different. But they've just got to be uh, careful that people, again, don't just add nonsense to a flip to try make it some sort of debut. But definitely that story that you've just told is is very interesting. and. Yeah, you're right, because most because uh, Olympic boxing is amateur level, right? Yeah. 
So they don't tend to stay an amateur for very long. So to win the Olympics twice in the same era, as you say, they must have been different weights, and that's that's a pretty interesting and and rare event that probably won't happen in a very long time. Yeah, it's it's one of those where again it could be fifty years until it happens again if it ever happens again. Um, but yeah, it's it's actually funny one as well with, with boxing. Um, you know, when you talk about the likes of in football, you have the friendly debut, preseason <laughs> debuts, um, you know, Champions League debut, professional debut, etc. At least when it comes to boxing, you don't have that kind of uh, issue. You know, the guy turns professional yeah. once, <laughs> and that's it. His first fight is his first professional fight, and and that's really it. Unless you're talking maybe Olympics tickets and that. Um, but again, the market really isn't there for them as much as it is, as it is for the professional stuff. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, at least there's no kind of major kind of um, issue in terms of identifying the debut. Yeah. Well, you've mentioned kind of that love and desire for doing research on pretty obscure tickets. I'm sure you've got tickets with you. Is there any stories you want to tell that aren't really uh, as appreciated as you believe they should be? Um, so there's kind of a, a really, well, to me, it's, it's a funny one because it, feels like something that if it happened today it would have been a much bigger deal than when it actually happened mm -hmm. so this one here is a ticket um from the fight between Leila ali and jackie fraser uh and it, i've heard this one i don't know if i saw it on discord yeah it, it probably was actually myself on, on discord at the time yeah but again those two people are muhammad ali's daughter and joe fraser's daughter <laughs> and they fought each other in 2001 and the fight was actually branded Ali versus Fraser 4, <laughs> probably in order to <laughs> to kind of sell it. Um, but it's something that I look at and I just think, wow, if, if that was today, the amount of money that that would have generated is absolutely ridiculous. Um, again, at the time, you're talking 2001, probably about 14, 15 years before kind of women's boxing took off on a professional level. Mm -hmm. um, and again, with the star power. You know, it's it's Muhammad Ali's daughter versus Joe Frazier's daughter. That the fact that they'd even yeah. meet in the same weight division is <laughs> absolutely insane, or the fact that they'd even both become professional uh, boxers is is quite ridiculous. But if that was in the the era of social media, you can just imagine the amount of hype that would have gone into it. You know, absolutely. Yes, absolutely. That's got me thinking now because I know Messi and Ronaldo both have sons at similar ages, <laughs> and I'm thinking now oh, the first matchup between Ronaldo's kid. <laughs> and um, Messi's kid, whenever that may be. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm sure there's some crazy <laughs> matchups like that in in history as well. Like I'd imagine, um, Johan Cruyff's son obviously was a, a professional uh, footballer. I'd imagine at some point in his career he probably played against the son of another famous professional footballer. You know? Yeah. Well, there's another interesting one, more modern to that is uh, Mbappe. Him and his brother, well, Kylian Mbappe and his brother both played for PSG in the first team. So it was about a few months ago now where they both made their appearance at the same time so I, I think that's a pretty cool one to look out for and modern I find pretty interesting because they are so hard to get hold of yeah 100% and even as we're starting to hear any other stories um, I want to hear some more of these stories shed some light on some of your cool pickups um, so this one isn't actually necessarily a ticket to a fight it's actually a ticket to a training camp as strange as okay. that sounds um, so it's one of Joe Lewis's training camps from back in the 1940s I believe it is or 1930s um, but there's a, a few of these that you see out there from time to time and people might look at it and think why would you want a ticket to a training camp um, you know surely the fight is the, the more attractive one which obviously it is um, but in that case it's, it's kind of famously known that at Joe Lewis's training camps there was often children uh, that would actually have tickets to, to go just watch the, the training camp so they'd go watch yeah. them sparring or go watch them swimming even I believe yeah. um, and there's all sorts of different tickets out there for that but it's just the fact of coming across one of these was kind of funny to me because I was thinking well if these were mostly handed out to kids what's the chances that it would even be in the condition that it's in all these years later um, yeah. but also even for this I believe there's a, a similar one in the Smithsonian Museum's uh, collection for African American history and that was oh, okay. at the time that was the only comparison that I could find online so I was like I'm just going to pick it up because it's a cool story um, again just the thought of getting a, a ticket to a, a training camp uh, just seems bizarre <laughs> to me as well so that's one that I picked up um, I suppose just in terms of other tickets there's not really too many kind of outright oddities um, there is stuff that personally I'd be passionate about that a lot of people would look at and just wonder why would you really collect that um, yeah I like to collect tickets from the uh, boxer Prince Nassim Hamid. 
Um, so again, he would have been quite popular this side of the world, going back to the the nineties and early two thousands. Um, mm-hmm. So again, one of my favorites of all time. His tickets aren't hugely expensive by any means, um, but I have been working on a collection of those to see how many of his professional fights I can actually get. Um, so that takes me into strange places of the internet um, <laughs> when I'm doing my research. Um, just thinking, even outside of that, is there any other kind of strange ones? Um, not really as much. Um, I do have things like tickets from the, the Grammys. Uh, I've ended up getting yeah. a 2014 Grammys ticket there at one point. Uh, just, That's cool. just because of the visual appeal of it, you know, it was nothing to do with really the the event. I was just like, okay, you know, it's not every day you see something like that. Um, so I ended up purchasing it. Um, so it's just one of those. Any other Grammys other than 2014? Just, just the 2014 one. I haven't come across uh, many others. They're quite difficult to get a hold of because they there are some cool Grammys over the years. Yeah, yeah, of course, like the the one where Michael Jackson won pretty much everything. <laughs> I'd imagine. Yeah, what year was that? I f- oh, couldn't even think of it. I'd assume it's probably yeah. mid '80s, kind of mid or early '80s. Uh, I think yeah. it was for the either was it the Thriller album or or one of them from that period. I'm not a big Michael Jackson fan, but it, yeah, it w- probably '88 or '89 or something. Yeah, yeah, probably kind of mid mid late '80s, probably. But um, yeah, again, if that was something that came up, I probably would be interested in it. Um, even kind of F1 tickets is something I've dabbled in a little bit as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, mostly Ayrton Senna related. Um, so again, I have a few of those in the collection and that. A um, few music tickets. Uh, as I was mentioning earlier on, got one of those uh, Live Aid tickets. Got one from, um, again, the Freddie Mercury Tribute Concert was another one that I got a couple okay. of tickets from. Um, as well as Woodstock. Again, when it comes to yeah. music, Woodstock, as we said, kind of one of those those entry level tickets uh, that people do pick yeah. up um, but outside of that yeah not really anything too too unusual it's mostly been kind of boxing or sports based um, but I'm always on on the lookout for kind of anything kind of outside of the, the realm of what we're used to that might pop up mm-hmm. um, because those oddities even if they're not really worth a lot they're still fun to have absolutely and yeah we are price sensitive we can't unfortunately buy everything mm-hmm. so if you can pick up a pretty cool story like the uh the Ali Fraser number four <laughs> for an, a nice price. I'm not sure how much you paid, but that is a really cool story to tell, and I actually want one. Yeah, it's it's you sold me. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's a funny one because even when I saw it on on eBay, I was like, I knew that this fight had happened. You know, it's kind of in the back of the mind. Um, yeah. but even when I kind of read into it, I was like, nothing particularly significant happened at the fight either. But it's just the very fact that that managed to happen. Like everything that went into that coming together just seems ridiculous to me. Um, so yeah what is uh, what, what sort of price should you be looking at for something like that <laughs> um, to be honest I've seen them sell for anything between between like $30 and $100 I think yeah so something like that um, I don't even think there's any of them graded funnily enough um, oh really yeah on the pop report I don't think there's any any graded uh, I could be wrong on it but I, I, when I checked it I don't think there was um, so that's that's one out there yeah for anybody who likes collecting kind of oddities and sports um you know, it's certainly kind of fun, and I don't think there was a huge. I don't think there was a huge crowd for that one either. Um, mm-hmm. You know, by comparison to some of the the men's bouts, um, because again, for the time, women's boxing just not really kind of where it is exactly. today. Well, Koo, I, we've had an amazing conversation. You've definitely inspired me to think down different avenues. We've just passed the hour mark, which I tried to aim for, so that's great. And I'm sure again, it'll be an interesting one to have an episode two when uh, we can kind of come back and discuss more of these interesting oddity pickups yeah sounds good to me so thank you so much for your time do you want to give everyone your instagram so they uh, can follow you and stuff like that yeah uh, so i recently opened up an instagram it's at boxing ticket museum um so again it's just where i happen to to kind of catalog my collection um so that's where you can find me amazing give that a follow and like this video subscribe if you're new and yeah cool thank you so much for coming on and i look forward to uh, seeing some new stuff on discord soon my pleasure take care bye bye